What I am amazed at is that serious thinkers today continue to ask us to choose between God and science. That's like asking people to choose between Henry Ford and engineering as an explanation of the motor car. Hola a todos, bienvenidos a God Science. Mi nombre es Cristian Jiménez. En esta ocasión les traemos uno de los debates más importantes del Dr. Lennox en la Unión de Oxford. Y bueno, recientemente el doctor se encuentra cumpliendo 80 años, así que creo que este es un momento oportuno para reflexionar sobre las contribuciones tan significativas que ha hecho esta persona en el campo de la ciencia, la filosofía y la teología a lo largo de su distinguida carrera. Además, para aquellos que desean profundizar en los temas discutidos en este video, les animamos a visitar nuestra página web. Ahí van a encontrar un artículo detallado que resume los argumentos presentados por el Dr. Lennox. Así que sin más, disfrutemos de este debate. I believe in the supernatural God who created the heavens and the earth. I believe in a God who holds the heavens and the earth in existence. I believe that on the basis of rational evidence, similar to the beliefs held by the founders of this house, who gave this university the motto, Dominus Illuminatio Mea. They saw no contradiction between faith in God and the utmost excellence in rational inquiry. And if I dare mention my alma mater of Cambridge in this holy place, <laughs> I would remind you that on the door of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge are written the words, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. And as we look at the, at the rise of science in the 16th and 17th centuries, Alfred North Whitehead and many others commented that men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not ashamed of being both a scientist and a Christian, because arguably Christianity gave the subject. What I am amazed at is that serious thinkers today continue to ask us to choose between God and science. That's like asking people to choose between Henry Ford and engineering as an explanation of the motor car. When Newton discovered his law of gravity, he didn't say, I've got a law, I don't need God. No, he wrote the Principia Mathematica, arguably the greatest work in the whole history of science because he saw that God is not the same kind of explanation as a scientific explanation. God doesn't compete. Agency does not compete with mechanism and law. Why is there something rather than nothing? Alan Sandage, the brilliant cosmologist who became a Christian in his 50s, said God is the answer to that question. But people are now so desperate to show that the universe created itself from nothing which seems to me to be an immediate oxymoron. If I say X created Y, I'm assuming the existence of X to explain the existence of Y. If I say X created X, I'm assuming the existence of X to explain the existence of X, which simply shows that nonsense remains nonsense even if high-powered scientists utter it. It reminds me a little bit of G.K. Chesterton, who said, it is absurd to complain that it is unthinkable for an unthinkable God to make everything out of nothing, and then to pretend that it is more thinkable that nothing should turn itself into everything. The heavens declare the glory of God, says the ancient psalm. And we've unraveled a bit of that, seeing the fine-tuning of the fundamental forces of nature. It's something that's so striking to scientists that it demands explanation. And it seems to me that Arno Penzias hit it right. He is the Nobel Prize winner who discovered the microwave background on which a lot of the evidence for the Big Bang is based. He said astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. But I want to come to what I think is one of the fundamental arguments for theism. I take it this house believes in reason. That's why we're all here. And as a scientist, I believe that the universe is rationally intelligible. That is something that has struck some of the geniuses of science as demanding an explanation. 
Einstein said the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. And Wigner talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. How is it that a mathematician thinking in her head in here can come up with equations that seem to fit the universe out there? Well, how is it indeed? Because the irony of the atheist position here is evident. My atheist friends, and I have many of them, tell me that the driving force of evolution, which eventually produced our human cognitive faculties, reason included, was not primarily concerned with truth at all, but with survival. And we all know, ladies and gentlemen, what has often happened and still happens to truth when individuals or commercial enterprises or nations feel themselves threatened and struggle for survival. A leading philosopher, Alvin Plantinga of Notre Dame, says if atheists are right that we are the product of mindless, unguided natural processes, then they have given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties, and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including their atheism. Their biology and their belief in naturalism would therefore appear to be at war with each other in a conflict that has nothing at all to do with God. Yet my atheist friends still insist that it is rational for them to believe that the evolution of human reason was not directed for the purpose of discovering truth. And yet it is irrational for me to believe that human reason was designed and created by God to enable us to understand and believe the truth. Curious logic. By contrast with that, biblical theism asserts that ultimate reality is personal and intelligent, and the reason science works, and this was the motivating force that drove the great pioneers of science, is that the universe out there and the human mind in here that does the science are ultimately the product of the same intelligent divine mind. Human beings are made, we are told, in God's image, and that means that science can be done. That makes infinitely more sense to me as a scientist than atheism does. Now, let me come briefly to ethics. Ethical behavior, like rational behavior, of course, does not itself require religious belief. This is consistent with the fact that humans are created in God's image as rational moral persons. But just as I suggest that rationality cannot be explained without the existence of God, so I dare to suggest that the existence of morality cannot be explained either. As modern science sprang from Judeo-Christian sources, so did the concept of human equality. Listen to atheist Jürgen Habermas, arguably one of Germany's leading intellectuals. He said that universalistic egalitarianism, from which sprang the ideals of freedom and a collective life and solidarity, the individual morality of conscience, human rights and democracy is the direct legacy of the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. This legacy, substantially unchanged, has been the object of continual critical appropriation and reinterpretation. To this day, there's no alternative to it. Everything else is just idle, postmodern talk. And it seems to me he's hitting the core of something important, because the value of a human being on which such egalitarianism rests is based not on what the human being can do, but what she's made of, or how she's made in God's image. I never forget speaking when, on one of my many visits to Russia uh, to a colleague in the Academy of Sciences. And he said, you know, John, we thought we could abolish God and retain a value for human beings. We found we couldn't, and we murdered millions of them. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn has said, if I'm asked, why is it that 60 million of my fellow countrymen were sacrificed? He said, the answer is, we have forgotten God. Science, of course, marvelous as it is, is limited. Even a Nobel Prize winner, by analyzing a cake, cannot tell why it was made. But Aunt Matilda, who made it, can tell you. She can reveal it to you. But if she doesn't reveal it to you, you'll never know. And that brings me to be my next evidence. It's the same with the universe. We can analyze it magnificently. But ultimately, if it has a maker, and I believe it has, only he can tell us what it's all about. And he's done so in the powerful narrative of the Bible. 
in particular in its analysis of the problem with humanity, not simply in terms of behavioral breakdown between people, but a vertical breakdown of trust between us and the Creator. The unique solution to that problem is not simply in terms of human ethical development, although that's very important, but in terms of something far deeper altogether, the restoration of the fractured relationship with God through the salvation He has brought through Jesus Christ, a radical relationship that empowers us to live ethically from God. And here we reach what for me is the chief evidence, not only for the existence, but the nature of God. It is Jesus Christ. He it was who not only taught the golden rule, but embodied it, fed the hungry, healed the sick and suffering, and welcomed society's outcasts, brought honor and respect to the marginalized and ashamed. And he's brought forgiveness and peace to multi-millions Uh, around the world. He's able to do this, of course, because though he was a man, he uniquely never was only a man, but God become human. The central evidence for this startling claim is, of course, his historical resurrection from the dead that launched Christianity in the world. This is, of course, ladies and gentlemen, a crunch issue. If Jesus rose from the dead, death is not the end, and atheism is false. If Jesus did did not rise from the dead, Christianity is false. And I remember at Cambridge as a student listening to the brilliant Sir Norman Anderson, a legal expert, going through forensically the evidence from his legal perspective as a, a brilliant lawyer, and he said at the end of it, The empty tomb, then, of Jesus forms a veritable rock on which all rationalistic theories of the resurrection dash themselves in vain. Just finally now, as I read the Bible, I do not only find intellectual satisfaction, but I find a great deal of that. I sense the voice of God speaking to me. You say, that's intensely personal. But ladies and gentlemen, we've been asked tonight about belief in God. And I want to strongly emphasize that God is not a theory, He's a person. And if the origination of me qua person is a personal God, then the most exciting thing really is, is there a possibility of getting to know God? And so I don't simply believe there is a God. I've come to know Him and trust Him, and I have strong reasons for doing so because of Christ dying and rising again for me. And that has generated in me a sense of utterly unmerited forgiveness, acceptance, and peace that has enabled me to face the ugly side of my own nature and with God's help to do something about it. But it's enabled me to face something else. The hardest problem I face as a Christian is the problem of evil and pain. My niece getting a tumor at 22 that kills her. What do I say to my sister? And this is the hardest problem we face. But it seems to me that atheism here has no answer, because by definition, atheism believes that human death is the end, so there is no ultimate hope. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, We could stay here till midnight and beyond arguing, as has been done in this university for centuries, what a good God should, might, would, could, if not, possibly might, just could He not have done, and we'll get nowhere. So it seems to me there's another question we can ask, and it's this. Granted that life presents us with a double picture, we see some beautiful things. We see some ragged edges. We see hurt and pain, and we see joy. How can we come to terms with that? And it seems to me here is no simplistic answer, but a window into an answer, and it's this. If it is actually true that Jesus is, as I believe him to be, the Son of God, then we can ask the question, what is God doing on a cross? And the answer comes back at the very least. God has not remained distant from our human suffering, but has become part of it. And the other side of that is this. Because Jesus rose from the dead, He is going to be the ultimate judge. Now, here's an irony, because atheism has no ultimate hope of justice by definition. 
the vast majority of people in the history of the world have died without justice and will die without justice. And if death is the end, then of course they have no hope of ju ultimate justice. But the promise in the New Testament, guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus, is that he is to be the judge in the coming day. So, ladies and gentlemen, those are some of the reasons why I believe that God is real and worthy to be trusted. Thank you. Impresionante. Yo creo que esto es lo que hoy más que nunca necesita nuestra, necesita nuestra sociedad. El debate académico, la argumentación seria, el respeto, eh, algo que está ausente en todas las áreas de nuestra sociedad. Incluso dentro de los mismos círculos eh, cristianos o religiosos, eh, vemos realmente una, un nivel muy bajo, no solamente en la parte argumentativa, que obviamente, dependiendo del nivel y la, y la formación de la persona, pues va a variar, pero yo creo que elementos eh, tan, tan importantes como la decencia, la seriedad, por ejemplo, aquí lo que estamos viendo es un grupo de jóvenes y académicos en un aula, en un auditorio muy importante, histórico, conocido por la, por la promoción de ideas, por la discusión y por, por, con un fin en común, que es el avance de la, de la sociedad, en la humanidad. Y bueno, yo creo que esto es lo que necesitamos en la actualidad. Eh, más adelante estaremos comentando sobre, sobre el trabajo del doctor Lennox y estaremos trayendo más material para ustedes.